Ring 2008 on TSN is brought to you by the new Q Horsepower from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses. And Michelin, a better way forward. This week we're in beautiful, historic Quebec City. And you know, you walk around here, you think you're in Europe. The architecture, the restaurants, and the cars. Yes, the cars, because like Europeans, Quebecers have always loved their small cars, whether the price of crude oil was 30 bucks or 80 bucks a barrel. And you know, these days, small is becoming very cool. In fact, the compact market makes up almost 50% of the Canadian automotive industry. So it seems only fitting that Suzuki has selected Quebec City to introduce its brand new SX4 sedan, a vehicle they're hoping will find a sweet spot among some very stiff competition. One out of every two new cars sold in Canada is a compact car. So we're really excited to have a, a car, obviously, that competes in the heart of the Canadian market. Last year we saw huge increases with SX4 hatchback. This new sedan just gives us a wonderful opportunity to grow the business in leaps and bounds. We know the Canadians love purchasing compact cars. We have what we believe to be one of the best entrants now in that segment. With the hatchback, our market share jumped to 5%, just out of nowhere, basically. 5% of the share with this brand new car from Suzuki. Uh, the sedan will be just as strong in the sedan segment of the compact segment. So that, that'll equate to easily 20,000 vehicles if we just do the same job we're doing today. The powertrain, it's a two liter dual overhead cam four cylinder engine, produces 143 horsepower with 136 pound feet of torque. Your options are either a five speed manual transmission or a four speed automatic. Normally, I'm a hatchback fan, and when I, when I see them do a sedan, I'm sort of, well, you know, that why are we bothering with this? But this one, I can really see a, a a good transition in this from the hatchback to the sedan. It handles nice. It's uh, the ride's a little firm, but uh, the interior quality is really nice. And I'm very, very impressed with how torquey the engine is. That's really, really well done. The way that we look at the compact market in Canada, we see that there are basically two segments to it. One side is your basic commuter, so that's your entry-level vehicle, your daily driver, point A to B commuter car. The other side of the market is what we call the premium segment, and these are your more sporty handling, more feature-laden vehicles. We feel that there is an opportunity that basically lies in the middle. So you have a very feature-packed, sporty handling, but also well-priced vehicle. Things I like and don't like about the SX4 under the column, you've heard me say this before, there's no latch to open up the trunk. In fact, you don't even have a button on the key fob. So, you go back 10 years and you use the key. Life's not so bad after all. Inside, which you gotta like, 439 liters of cargo space. Class leading, in fact, they tell me there's more cargo space in this trunk than in the current Honda Accord. And a final pet peeve, you know those split folding back seats you like to fold down for some extra room? It ain't gonna happen in the SX4. Yeah, I think this is a real step ahead for Suzuki. Uh, it, the SX4 um, hatchback was, was obviously a, a major move into this market and, and finally gave them something they could really compete with. And the um, sedan, given the, uh, you know, our interest in sedans in, the, in that marketplace, and the things like a huge trunk and, um, you know, it's got a roomy enough cabin. There's certainly room for four in there and five if you cram somebody into the back. They've come a long way. They've still got a long way to go as far as perception goes, I believe, from the public. Uh, they're going to need a, a larger dealer network, but I think uh, one of the representatives put it best. He said, this is the car company that nobody knows. And they're known for their motorcycles, uh, maybe not so much as the cars, and I think if anything's going to break them through, it, it's going to be a vehicle like this. Here's new math for you, boys and girls. When it comes to safety, 50 over 100, equals zero. More later on Kenzie's Corner. With Ford and GM heading for the crossover hills, Chrysler's hoping its latest minivan will score an even larger share of the lucrative minivan market. How the minivan market came to fruition is open to debate, 
Was it the Chevrolet Greenbrier, the Dodge Caravan, Toyota Van LE, or maybe even the VW bus? One thing that's not up for debate is which company defined the modern minivan. When Chrysler launched the original Magic Wagon in 1984, it set a standard most are still trying to match to this day. The new van builds on this enviable edge. The beauty of this new minivan is that you can put as much or as little into it as you want. There are, however, a couple of things you really want to consider if you are into the minivan market. First of all, these seats come covered in Yes Essentials fabric. Now this stuff is stain and odor resistant, and so it's a godsend for anyone with young children. The other thing, right here, my gig. This thing is a large hard drive that'll hold both photographs and your own personal music supply. It's sort of like having a built-in iPod. The other thing, it's smart enough that it can play three different things at the same time. So the people up front, they can listen to the radio, the two in the back, one can listen to a soundtrack or a CD, and the other one to Sirius Satellite Radio. It stops an awful lot of arguing. Dynamically, the Grand Caravan does not stray too far from its roots. The reworked suspension brings a comfortably compliant ride while keeping unwanted body motion in check. Drive it enthusiastically, however, and the tires do begin to howl. Push a little harder and you will run into understeer. Now this is not a knock. Given the focus on cargo and or passenger carrying capabilities, the early warning signs are actually appreciated. The other upside is the steering points in with a type of precision minivans are not normally noted for. In this regard, the Grand actually feels very car-like. Another option you can get in this Dodge Grand Caravan is the swivel and go seating. Now in a nutshell, it allows the middle row to turn through 180 degrees, you install this card table and Bob's your uncle. You've gone from automotive conveyance to living room. There is, however, one drawback. In this particular vehicle, there's only one DVD screen. When you set it up like this, those two are bored, we get to watch the movie. They need another DVD screen back here that points that way. Anti-lock brakes and electronic stability and traction control systems are all standard on all versions of this van. The beauty is that the level of intervention is kept to a minimum, and so when you do jump on the brakes, the anti-lock only steps in when it's actually needed. Repeated stops did not introduce any fade, and with a stopping distance of 43 metres, the Grand is up to minivan standards. One of the advantages to the Grand Caravan is the amount of stuff you can actually carry inside it. Now, if you're using the third row, there's actually quite a lot of luggage space. Primarily, back here, there's a large hole where the seat would normally go, as well as two underfloor lockers in the middle of the van. If you fold the third row down, you end up with enough space for four adults and two weeks' worth of luggage. Take the middle row out altogether, and this thing will swallow 143 cubic feet of your stuff. While the base Grand Caravan comes with a 175 horsepower 3.3 litre V6 and a 4 speed auto, the better choice is the 197 horsepower 3.8 litre V6 that's married to a 6 speed automatic transmission. Adding the gears means a much better launch off the line and quieter highway cruising. In the usual 0 to 100 km an hour test, the Grand posted a time of 9.5 seconds and an 80 to 120 passing time of 7.8 seconds. Now neither is going to set the world on fire, but considering the Grand's station in life, both are more than acceptable and a match for the key competition. The latest Dodge Grand Caravan is a big vehicle, not only physically but also in the way you can equip it. The bottom line, if you need to carry five, six or seven people on a regular basis, this vehicle is about as good as you'll find in the marketplace. A better way forward. Richard Spinard is one of Canada's most successful race drivers. A member of Canada's Motorsport Hall of Fame, he holds the record for most victories in Canadian road history, and he's even won a championship racing on ice. 
These days, when the weather gets cold, Richard travels across the country promoting the benefits of winter tires. One, two, three, go. Why me? Um, well, being a race car driver, we learn quickly that the tire is the most important piece of equipment. You can have the best engineer, the best car, best suspension, best everything. But if you don't have the right tire combination, uh, because you know there's only four little square touching the pavement, and that is not good enough. You're not going to go quick around the racetrack, and you're not going to be safe on the road if you don't have the right equipment. So it was important to us in racing. It's important to the consumer during the winter. Uh, so the message here is very simple. It's getting cold. We need to change our all-season tires to winter tires because the winter tire is a better piece of equipment for safety. Let's not wait for a snowstorm. We gotta use our winter tires as soon as it gets colder than seven degrees centigrade. Because at seven degrees centigrade and colder, this is where your all-season tire starts to lose its ability, its elasticity, it loses its grip. We test it and test it time after time on different conditions. And a winter tire will always use about 25% less distance in braking than an all-season tire. And 25% is a huge amount of distance if you don't have that room in front of you. And as you see, you need all of the room and more. A winter tire is so much, so much better. Closed captioning of Motoring 2008 is brought to you in part by Pontiac. Pontiac, ignite the feeling. The new SX4 comes with both an automatic and a five-speed manual. If I'm buying, it's my coin, it's a no-brainer, I'm going with the manual. It's peppier and the vehicle is just a lot more fun to drive than the automatic. But you know, we're always trying to get the best fuel mileage out of our vehicle. So if it's an automatic versus a standard, which way should we go? Well, let's put that question to our man in the Quaker State Garage, Bill Gardner. Brad, the car with the standard transmission will usually win the fuel economy race, but you know, things are even changing there. Now you're seeing more cars with five, six, and even seven speed automatics and CVTs, continuously variable transmissions. So they're trying to close that gap, that advantage that the standard transmission cars used to have on fuel economy. Now this week, I want to talk about stabilizer bars and the stabilizer links that hook the stabilizer bar to your suspension front and rear. Now when you see a car weaving in and out of pylons on a slalom or solo one course, or when we're testing a new car, or when you're on an off ramp or doing a lane change, one of the parts that you're really stressing is the, the stabilizer bars in that car. And the stabilizer bars, as the name implies, stabilize the front end of the, of the uh, vehicle so that when you're cornering, you don't get that excessive body roll or lean when you're going around an on or off ramp, and you don't get the body rolling back and forth when you're making lane changes. So if the stabilizer bar is not working properly, you're gonna get a lot of body roll when you're cornering. Now this 2000 Toyota Tundra pickup's got 233,000 K, and when we look closely in the front suspension, we can see that the front stabilizer link kits are completely broken. The links are broken on both sides. If I reach in here, I can move the stabilizer bar up and down four or five inches with very little resistance. That tells you that the far side is broken. We can look at this side and see that it's broken. There's our new stabilizer link right there and it'll go in there and it ties the lower control arm to the stabilizer bar to keep that vehicle level, flat and stable in those lane changes and high speed corners. Now, think about what kind of drivers really need that front stabilizer bar to be working properly. Well, those guys with the baseball cap on backwards driving the lowered Civics and Integras, yeah, they're really stressing them to the max, but you know what, I'm thinking about another guy that, you know, a guy that would take a full-size pickup truck that's intended just for towing and hauling and run it through a slalom course around pylons at really high speed like it was a Corvette. Rip the heck out of the tires doing it. Now, who would that be? Gee, uh, maybe it's the guy that's got to wear his full coverage helmet to this year's Christmas party, Graham Fletcher. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2008.
Time to welcome the 2008 Subaru Impreza into the motoring long-term fleet. This third-generation Impreza is available in both sedan and hatch models. We chose the hatch, why? Well, because it looks cool and it should be the big seller. Both come with a choice of a five-speed manual or a four-speed automatic with sport shift. A Subaru says the only thing that carries over from the previous generation is the name. New chassis, new design, new interior. Now this car comes loaded with standard features like all-wheel drive, side impact and side curtain airbags, anti-lock brakes, 16-inch wheels, and the list goes on. Now our tester comes with a $2,500 sports package that includes premium audio and heated seats to name a few. The 2.5i Boxer engine boasts 170 horsepower and 170 pound-feet of torque at a low 4,400 RPM. You know, it's hard to believe that a company that's been selling cars in North America since the 80s would have an image problem. Yet, recently, the president of Subaru was going through airport customs, and the officer asked him, Subaru, is that French or Swiss? <laughs> I know. Hard to believe, but you know what? Subaru is convinced that even with the WRX in the lineup, they believe this Impreza will give them the awareness they're looking for as well as a much needed sporty image. And of course, you get the reliability and the durability that's been the secret to Subaru's success. But you know, they're gonna get your attention by dropping the price $2,000 from the previous model, yet they're adding goodies. We'll talk more about that on a future update. And as you can see, Old Man Winter is here, so it'll give us an opportunity to test the very foundation of a Subaru, and that's the all-wheel drive. Shanghai is its a staggering city. It, it just, to me, it, it kind of borders on something that Disney would build or George Lucas for a movie. There are so many futuristic buildings. The size of the city is beyond imagination. The roadways are great. They're obviously built for the future. And uh, somehow they're able to put 16 million people in here with the most bizarre traffic in the world. And yet there aren't that many horns and I haven't seen a single car crashed. When you see what traffic really is, which is the traffic on the highways and on the roads in Shanghai. When you see the number of cars in a country that where people couldn't own a car five years ago, when you think that what we are seeing is a very small percentage of the population of China and that most people in China have yet to buy a car, um, you start to realize how frightening this growth and development in third, second world countries is. I mean, I see the guys on the bicycles looking at cars and you know they want the personal freedom that we have in America and why shouldn't they have it? You see the, the status of the infrastructure, you realize some of the safety issues with people on bikes and uh, the lack of perhaps safety standards. The Chinese government is very interested, obviously, in improving uh, not only the status of the safety of its civilians, but also they're looking to perhaps leapfrog, in a technology sense, what's happening with the cars here. The, the pollution is, is apparent. Uh, they are very interested in how to deal with it, and I think you know, the Challenge Babendum, among other venues here, is going to help them come up with some solutions that, that perhaps can lead to a better situation. Well, the Ontario government has its latest salvo in its attempt to save your life on the highway. Now if you're convicted of going 50k over the speed limit, you face a license suspension and impoundment of your car. Well, don't you sleep better at night now? Now, if it's 50k over a 40k limit in a school zone, hey, throw the guy in jail for the rest of his life, be my guest. But 50k over the limit on the freeway, where the theoretical limit's 100, but the real limit's 120 or 130, that seems a bit much, don't you think? Because it's also pointless. The only two things that matter for traffic safety, seat belts, impaired driving, nothing else really matters. So what do we do? 
We have cops conducting blitzes on commercial vehicles and taking the pickup trucks off the road because they've got a tiny pinhole in the floor. Well, yeah, thanks for looking after our safety guys, but there are more important things to do. Meanwhile, you've taken a guy off his job, he can't feed his kids. What's the point of that? Some people say, well, they just do this to raise money. Well, you got a $60,000 a year cop in a $40,000 vehicle. It's not a very efficient way to do it. If you really need the money, just raise the taxes. At least be honest about it. You want to do something about traffic safety? Well, first of all, you can start watching the show because I don't know where you're getting your ideas. You're not getting them from here. The only two things you got to do, you got to make the speed limit realistic, which it currently isn't. Repaint the lines on the highway so the right lane doesn't disappear. Enforce lane discipline. And guess what? That's as good as it's going to get then we're all going to be better off. Because every day of the year, people are voting for the speed limit, and it ain't 100. But when you vote for the government, well, you know, it doesn't matter who you vote for, the government always gets in. I'm Jim Kenzie. You know, I don't know why, but the older I get, the more I enjoy driving small cars. I don't know, it just makes so much sense. And you know, the Suzuki SX4 makes a lot of sense. It's a good, reliable car. Hey, it's not exciting, but then again, it's an entry-level sedan. If you're looking for a little excitement when it comes to styling, of course, Suzuki can offer the hatchback. And you know, Suzuki is hoping for big things from the SX4 as well as from itself. In 2006, it sold just over 11,000 vehicles in Canada. This year, the number they hope will be about 13,000, but in 2011, Suzuki is hoping to sell 20,000 vehicles. And of course, they're hoping the SX4 will play a big part in reaching that goal. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. The very first time I came, my first event, I came up and I saw all the cars lined up and I just thought, oh my God, I, it was a dream. I, I said, I phoned home, I said, somebody pinch me because it was a, an opportunity to drive all kinds of things that I'd been wanting to drive. It's an important event. I mean, uh, there's a lot of prestige that comes with Car of the Year or winning category because you are competing against uh, other manufacturers in the same category. So, and, and the auto riders are the kind of people that know what makes a good car, what makes a bad car. So if they say, yeah, this is a good one, then, you know, it's, it means a lot for the manufacturer. Motoring 2008 on TSN has been brought to you by the new Q Horsepower from Quaker State. Unleash all your horses and Michelin, a better way forward.